morning everyone, welcome to Lakes. We're currently in the church right now. And you're not here with us, but you are with us at the same time, which is really strange. Um, yeah, it's good to see you guys. Welcome to Sunday and have a great time. See you soon.
We're blessed to be here to gather, to share in communion once again. And even though it's online, we can still share that together. So if you um, grab something to eat and something to drink, we'll share communion together. I want to read for you a passage from uh, the Gospel of Mark about the Last Supper. Jesus had told his disciples to go off and to prepare a place uh, to have the, um, the last communion together, uh, the festival of um, unleavened bread or the Passover meal together. And uh, when the evening came, uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 17 says, When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me one who is eating with me now. They were all saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It's one of you twelve, he replied, one who dips his bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him to have not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, And they all drank, as he said, This is my blood, the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again until the fruit of the vine I'm sorry, I'll not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. When they had sung a hymn, they went out from the Mount of Olives. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for the precious gift of your word. Lord, I thank you for this time of communion together now. Lead us through it now. Be honored through it all. Amen. Look, I'm amazed by this story because Jesus is sitting with the one who's about to betray him, who's Judas. He's also sitting with Peter, who's going to deny him three times over the next few days as Jesus suffers and is crucified for him, for us. I love this story because it shows how we are. We want to do what's best and we want to say, surely, God, you don't mean me. Surely, Jesus, you don't mean me. I would never betray you. I would never do what's wrong. And yet we do what's wrong. Over and over. And he forgives us. Over and over. He shows us grace. Over and over. And in this meal, Jesus takes the bread. And he breaks it. And he says, This is my body, which is broken for you. Let's eat together. After the meal, he takes the juice, the wine at the time, and he says, this is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for for many. Isaiah tells us that he takes our sins on his shoulders, on his back. By his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. And what caused him harm brought us peace. He suffered for the many, for you and for me. He who was without sin became sin for us and shed his own blood on the cross so that we could have life. Now any who trust in him has eternal life. is saved forevermore. Let's drink together and remember this sacrifice. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your amazing love for us. In that you know us completely and yet you still love us completely. Lord, help us to reflect on that now. As we eat this bread, Lord, help us to reflect on the the body of Christ, which is battered and beaten and bruised for our sins, paying the price for us. As we've had this drink, Lord, help us to remember the blood of Jesus which offers life, not condemnation. 
Thank you for your awesome love for us, for the awesome grace you give to us, and for the opportunity to reflect on that now. May we be challenged as your church to live out that love and grace in our community, in our families, in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've done this church thing for a long time now, and I think I've got something important to say about it, about your expectations, and about you. Here's the deal with the church you are in right now. There could be something deep in your heart that changes today. We hope for that. In fact, we pray for that. But honestly, in my experience, the chances are, well, kind of slim. Now, I know that sounds a bit harsh, even blunt, but I don't know if there's much that can really change a person in 60 minutes. We all know that real change takes a lifetime. They'll ask you to focus on God, and that's a great thing. 
but it'll be almost impossible to really focus, especially with everything going on in your life. They'll ask you not to be apathetic. I assure you, nobody's apathetic about Jesus. You've just heard this message over and over. Now, I really don't want to sound negative, so when they sing, sing along. When they pray, close your eyes. And when they study the Bible, follow along. But as you do these things, my advice to you is simple, really simple. Be careful how much you allow your heart to lean in, to lean in toward God, to lean in toward the other people in the room. Oh, there will be a time for you to lean in more, but it might not be today. So hey, thanks for taking the time to listen. I don't consider myself an expert or anything. I've just been around long enough to have a little experience in the church. I hope you have a great day and that this church meets your expectations. And if you need anything at all, or you just want to talk, I'll be around. The church is far from where it needs to be. We're far from perfect. We'll let you down at times, and at times we'll not meet your expectations. You may have heard the old saying, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll just mess it up. Well, we're not perfect, but we're a bunch of sinful, fallen people who are saved by the grace of God, who are growing in the knowledge and the truth of God's word and maturing, even transforming, to reflect God's glory and grace. We are forgiven. We have life, peace, and grace, thanks to our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Satan is darkness. And he breathes darkness. He infects the whole world with darkness. He covers our marriages with darkness. He creates chaos in our families with darkness and damages the church with darkness. Christ is the light of the world. And today we're going to look uh, from uh, what the Gospel of Mark says about the power that the light of Christ has over the darkness of sin, the darkness of Satan. If you have your copy of Scripture, I invite you to turn with me to uh, the book of Mark. It's a New Testament book of Mark, one of the Gospels. Uh, we're going to be skipping around in Mark a little bit. In fact, we're going to be covering some stories from Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 5, and Mark chapter 9. So if you want to go ahead and mark those, chapter 1, chapter 5, and chapter 9. Let me just start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for the precious gift of your word. I pray, Lord, that you lead us through it now. Help us to honor you in all that we do, to learn more of you, to experience more of you, to follow you more faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've uh, talked a little bit about uh, some of the miracles of God. And last week we talked about some of the healing miracles that Jesus did while he was on earth. And this week we're talking about more of the spiritual power of Christ over Satan. And uh, we'll see that in the three stories illustrated for us today. Um, our first story is in Mark chapter 1, verses 28, uh, sorry, 21 to 28. Mark chapter 1, verse 21 to 28. And so... Uh, we're going to start our journey there. You see, in this story, Jesus walks into the synagogue up on the Sabbath day, and he starts to teach. Now, according to the Jewish tradition, um, any Jewish man uh, could just walk into a synagogue and start to teach. Now, often they didn't have extensive uh, scriptural knowledge, uh, but they would repeat what other rabbis had said. And so, pass on the knowledge of the scriptures and so uh, a man a Jewish man might sit in the synagogue and say oh rabbi so-and-so says this or oh like rabbi so-and-so said that uh, and they would quote other rabbis who were uh, more knowledgeable in the scriptures but when Jesus spoke uh, it says that they were amazed at his teachings um, in verse 22 it says the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority not as the teachers of the law. You see, Jesus spoke the very words of God with authority from God, and this the people had never heard before. And they're going, oh, and remember that this, this guy says the scripture says this, or this guy says the scripture says this. But Jesus saying, here is the word of God, and he speaks it, the very words of God, and he speaks it with authority, and the people are amazed. Now, I've seen a lot of the crazy things in church. I've been around the church uh, a long time now. 
And you, have, you and I may have all been interrupted by, in different things, um, by different things in church. I've seen some crazy things, like I've seen uh, mice coming out from inside the organ when the organ was played during church. Uh, I've seen a bird flying in the window, uh, swooping toward uh, church attenders uh, throughout part of the service. Uh, at one time, in the middle of one of my sermons, uh, a possum came down and hung on a branch uh, near a window, and it kind of scraped against the window, and he's just sitting there, and about halfway through the sermon, uh, the possum just fell out of the tree and uh, kind of grabbed everyone's attention. But this service in Mark chapter 1 tops all of those. Jesus, while he's teaching in the synagogue, has this man who's been possessed by an evil spirit start to call out to him. In fact, it's actually the evil spirits or the demons inside this man that speak to Jesus. And we see this in verse 24. Um, Mark chapter 1, verse 24. These spirits say, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. What do you want with us? Have you come to destroy us? These demons say, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, I think this is interesting because the people who were around Jesus in the synagogue didn't recognize Jesus as the Son of God or the Holy One of God. His own disciples who walked with him and he was teaching barely understood that he was from God and the Son of God. They, they couldn't grasp what was really going on in the divinity of Jesus. And yet these demonic powers that are inside this man knew the power that is in Jesus. They knew the authority that is in Jesus. And they said, oh, Jesus, what have you come to do with us? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And Jesus just says to him, be quiet. Come out of him. And the man convulses. The spirit shrieks and then leaves him. And all the people were amazed at the authority of God, saying, uh, he speaks, and even these evil spirits obey him. Now, some people say, oh, uh, is there really such a thing as uh, demon possession? Is there really such a thing uh, as, as this sort of story, uh, did that really take place? Well, uh, some people say, oh, it's just a, it's a mental illness, or um, later on one of the stories uh, reflects epilepsy, and they say, well, maybe science hadn't figured out what it is yet, and they just thought it was evil spirits. That is not what it's talking about in this passage. It's not what it's talking about in these stories. These are very clearly possessions of an evil spirit, and in fact, there are many, many stories not only from, from third world countries, from missionary journeys where they've experienced demonic possession, but even in the, the greatest in, uh, cities in our Western world, people still experience that uh, today. Now, in Jesus' time, uh, in this time the stories were written, this is a very common occurrence. People are so used to that. And people are often outcast from the community because of these evil spirits and kind of seen, considered less than human. And it was a shame, and they were just kind of pushed outside the community. But Jesus confronted the spirit and drives him out of this man. And the spirit leaves by convulsing the man and then shrieks and leaves. Clearly, there is something more here than just a mental illness or a physical ailment. The power of God over the spirit is relentless, isn't it? It is extreme and is without question. The, the, the evil spirits themselves automatically know the authority in, in Jesus Christ. The evil spirits automatically know the power in Jesus, even though nobody else recognized it. They immediately saw that. And they came straight to him and said, what do you want with us? What are you going to do with us? And Jesus said, be gone. And the spirit had to leave. We worry so much about spiritual conflict and whether things exist or not. Demons are real, the devil is real, but God is real and his angels are real and God's power is so much stronger than the devil. The devil doesn't have a foothold that will hold him against God's power in Jesus. Another great story is found in, Matthew, or in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 20. If you turn with me in your copy of the scripture, Mark chapter 5 verse 1 to 20. I'm going to read some of that for you. Uh, but if you flip over to chapter 5, I'll start to tell a bit of the story and a little background. You see, Jesus travels across the lake, and as soon as he gets there, 
Uh, it says he travels to this area uh, of the, the, the Gerasenes, and uh, some versions say the Gerardines, so we're not really sure uh, where this region is. There is a little town called Gerardo, uh, uh, which is around five miles from the lake. But the scripture says here, as soon as Jesus got across the lake, he was immediately confronted by a man who was possessed by an evil spirit. A man who was possessed by an evil spirit came to him. Not exactly the greeting you want, is it? In fact, this was a dangerous man, a violent man, a man who nobody else could control because of his strength and his rage. And this man comes straight to Jesus. This man lived in the graveyard. Yes, the cemetery. He lived in the tombs among the dead. These were often caves that were either natural caves or, or carved out uh, to keep the bodies of the dead. And those who were kicked out of the community, as those who were demon possessed often were, sometimes if they weren't too scared of that they or disgusted by that, they lived among the dead. This man was incredibly annoying. Night and day, he called out from the tombs at the top of his lungs, screaming continually. Not the kind of neighbor you'd want, isn't it? He screamed out night and day from the tombs. This man was incredibly annoying, but also incredibly violent, incredibly strong. The people used to try to keep him in chains. Many times they tried to keep him in chains. But now the scripture says he just tears the chains apart and breaks the irons that were held his feet. The community had lost hope for this man. The community had lost hope with what to do. But when Jesus arrives, this man comes straight up to Jesus and falls at his feet. And at the top of his lungs, the demons inside him cry out, What do you want with us, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Jesus says to them, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then the demons ask Jesus not to torture them. Isn't this interesting? These demons who have controlled this man for so long, who have immense strength, it shows the strength of these demons in the, the increased strength of this man. Nothing could hold him. They tried to bind with chains his hands and his feet, and no one could control him. The chains could not hold him. These people had, they had no idea what to do with him. He lived outside the community and still tormented everyone. And yet this man, the, the demons inside him, fall, he falls at Jesus' feet, and the demons inside say, what do you want with us? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, please don't torture us. You have power over us. We are nothing to you, compared to you. And then Jesus simply says, what is your name? Read with me in Mark chapter 5, beginning verse 9. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And the answer is, my name is Legion, he replied. For we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out to the sea. I mean, it's interesting they're speaking through this man. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. And the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 of them in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, man and told them, about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus, please leave this region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had, who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Now, there were a lot of spirits, weren't there? It, it says, when Jesus says, what is your name? He said, we are legion. Now, legion was a group of about 6,000 Roman soldiers, uh, which probably in this case just meant a lot. 
Uh, we are a strong force, a uh, force to be reckoned with. Thousands. And when Jesus gives them permission, isn't it interesting? He gives them permission to do something. They can't do anything without Jesus' permission. Jesus has all authority over these spiritual forces, these demons. He gives them permission to go into the pigs, to leave this man and to go into the pigs. And about 2,000 pigs are all of a sudden possessed with these devils. And they run off a cliff and are drowned in the sea. Ironic thing here is that the people who were terrified by this man who had been demon-possessed now find out that this, this possessed man is fine now. He's sitting there dressed in his right mind, and all of a sudden now that this man has been set free, they're now afraid of Jesus. Verse 17 says, When they saw what had happened, they heard the stories of what Jesus had done. They pleaded with Jesus, Please just leave this region. The man here begs Jesus to let him follow him. But Jesus says, Go home to your own family and tell everyone what I've done. And he says he went all around the Decapolis, which is a, a group of, of ten uh, cities there. And he told the stories of what is done. And I kind of feel he would have done that even if Jesus hadn't said that, don't you? He couldn't wait to tell the story. This man has been freed of these thousands of demons. And it says when this man, who everyone knew in the area... Everyone had seen this man. Everyone had heard this man crying out from the tombs. They knew his story. Everyone who heard the story of Jesus changing his life, it says, were amazed. I know I've said lots of times there's understatements in the Bible. I think that's a huge understatement in, uh, in verse 20 of chapter 5 when it ends by saying, and all the people who heard the story of this man were amazed. I'm amazed. Wow, the power of our precious Jesus thousands of demons and Jesus just speaks and they're gone they ask they recognize immediately Jesus didn't have to come to them they saw him coming and they came to him and bowed at his feet and said what are you going to do with us don't destroy us please let us go into these pigs instead we'll leave this man if that's what you want let us go into those pigs don't torture us don't torment us and Jesus gives them permission Okay, I say you can go over there. And then they go. They can't move without him speaking. The authority, the power that is in our God is undeniable. The authority and the power that is in Jesus. Oh, it's exciting, isn't it? To know the strength of our God. Turn with me to Mark chapter 9. We hear our last story for the day. Mark chapter 9 tells the story of a little boy who's been possessed by a spirit. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. And we'll read some of that in just a moment. You see, Jesus, here he, he came down from a mountain. He was just on the mountain with a spiritual experience with Peter, James, and John. Uh, and um, he comes down from the mountain to find that some of the rest of his disciples were arguing uh, with some of the Jewish leaders. And Jesus just, he's disappointed and he says, what are you arguing about? And then this man comes up and tells him about his son. He says, look, my son has been possessed by an evil spirit that, that has robbed him of speech. And when the spirit comes on him, it tosses him to the ground and he, he foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and he becomes rigid. The man said he asked the disciples to free his son from the spirit, but they couldn't. And then Jesus looks to his disciples and he scolds them for their lack of faith. Jesus asked that the boy be brought to him. And look with me at what took place. Let's read Matthew chapter 9, uh, beginning verse 20. Matthew chapter 9, verse 20. So they brought him, this is the boy, to Jesus. They brought the boy to Jesus. And when the Spirit saw Jesus, immediately it threw the boy into convulsion. He fell on the ground and he rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It is often tried to throw him into the fire or the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, says Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. 
Immediately the boy's father exclaims, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw what a crowd was, uh, the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and he came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and the boy stood. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive him out? And he replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. What a great story, isn't it? A boy, probably an older boy, who has been possessed by the spirit that, that throws him to the ground. It's robbed him of speech. And it throws him on the ground to convulse and, um, and to foam at the mouth. Now, many would say, well, this looks a lot like epilepsy. This boy was just having an epileptic fit. But seeing as how the, when commanded by Jesus to come out, the spirit shrieked as it left the boy at Jesus' command. I think there's a little bit more to the story than science can explain. You see, the father, he, he, he believes that this boy can be healed, and so he comes to the disciples, and yet they're not able to heal him. They're not able to free him from these demons, and so he starts to doubt. So when he talks to Jesus, he says, oh, he's been like this all the way from childhood. Isn't it interesting that Jesus takes time to stop? He could have just said, Spirit, be gone. But he stops and talks to his father and says, how long has he been there? Has he been like this? How long has he suffered this way? Jesus shows compassion and empathy for this man. It's a beautiful thing of, of the love of the Savior. And then Jesus commands the spirit to be gone. But this man says, look, I came to the disciples and they could not free him. If you can do anything, can you have mercy on us, please? And Jesus, I love this passage in, uh, in verse uh, 23, uh, sorry, yeah, 23. Jesus says, if I can, anything is possible for those who believe. And so this father says, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Oh, how often we find ourselves in this father's shoes. I believe you can, God. Help the parts of me. Help the parts of me and the times that I can't fully trust you. I believe. Help me to fully believe. And then Jesus just says, deaf and mute spirit, come out. The boy convulses, the spirit shrieks, and all's over. This boy is freed by the power of God in Jesus. The spirit has no hold on this boy once Jesus steps in. The spirit has no hold on the Father, once the power of Jesus has stepped in, he fully believes in the power of God in Jesus and did the rest of his life, no doubt. The Spirit has no hold on you when Jesus steps in. Praise God. Satan is in this world, confined here for a season. The Bible says he's like a roaring, roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Oh, but we need not worry. We need not fear because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Satan has great power and influence. Yes, darkness is everywhere and we see it every day. But the light of God in Jesus shines out in the darkness to bring hope and lead to eternal life. Don't fear the darkness. For we are children of God and children of the light. Hope and trust in Jesus, who has power over all spiritual forces. He's conquered all other forces, and Jesus is victorious over all. To him be the honor and glory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for these stories of your power in Jesus. I thank you, Lord, because sometimes we come across things that we don't understand. We come across things that are too difficult for us. We come across spiritual things, battles that we must face. Even for Christians, those who have the Holy Spirit of God in their heart come across spiritual battles of times when they cannot see you. St. John of the Cross called it a dark night of the soul. And Lord, you are our light in those dark times. You are the strength 
when our strength is gone. And Lord, we recognize that although we feel the conflict at times, the battle belongs to you and you are victorious. We trust you and your power and your authority. We call on you and your power and authority. Lord, be Lord in our lives. We believe. Help us with our unbelief. May we fully trust in you and just see your miracles happen. You, thank you, Lord, for being our, our miracle-working God. Thank you for the way you love us. Thank you for the way you protect us. Thank you for the power and authority that you have and the way you use that to show love and grace to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Before we go, I just wanted to end in prayer. Just a quick prayer. Quick for me. Maybe not quick for you. Um, and yeah, just to, to end things properly by spending a little bit of time with our God. All right, let's do it. God, I thank you that you are a God who loves us regardless of where we are in our life. With every season, God, with every up and down, with the bad days, the good days, the sad days, the, the happy and joyous days, God, I thank you that you are there in all of it. I thank you that you know what you want to do through each season in our lives. So God, for those who are actually hurting right now, I just pray that you have your hand on them that you assure them that you do know what your plans are through it. I just ask that um, the words that, that there are plans and purposes behind the situations they've faced, God, I, I pray that they are words that stand out to them with the knowledge that you are their ultimate peace and calm and that you are not one to be swayed. Um, I just pray that you have your hand on them, that you just fall onto them, God, that... You give them the peace that they're seeking. And God, for those who are facing triumph, who are facing situations that are exciting, God, I just thank you for those blessings. And I thank you for the work that you're doing through those blessings, God. For the situations in life that are special, whether that's a new house, new baby, new car, new experience, whatever it is, God, you know what, what you're doing through those beautiful blessings. And I just pray that we are a church that turns to you in those times and we're able to say thank you, God. Thank you for loving us and for giving us these amazing experiences. And thank you that you um, give us those days to celebrate and just, yeah, just to be able to spend that time with you in a different way. God, have your hand on those who are traveling. Although we're not doing much traveling here at, in 2020, those who are in different states, we do think of those those beautiful people right now. Um, just have your hand on those people, God. Um, they're obviously still part of our church family, even if they're not actually here present with us in this building um, today, just as we all are in our own homes and, and, and different places. Um, but yeah, just have your hand on them and keep each of us safe. Keep us safe from sickness, from illness, um, from the things that may do us a little bit too much harm, God. When we're tempted to, to stray and, and fall away from you, I just pray that you put those things in place that keep us firmly focused on who you are and who you want us to be. God, we want to be a people who will make you proud. So when we need it, God, we ask for those reprimanding um, moments. We, we ask for the, the discipline and the structure if that's what we need, if that's what we need to keep our eyes on you, God, then we ask for that. Just let us be a church that make you proud and work on us as individuals to do that. God, I just pray for our kids. <clears throat> I pray that they hear you through the way that they see us interacting, God. Let us be a church that our kids strive to live like um yeah let us be be the role models that you want us to be and finally god i just ask that you be with those who are sad who are hurting god i just pray that you just um you just able able to pick them up and and hold them for a little bit longer and show us how to do the same in the ways that we need to god this is a church that has their eyes on you in terms of how we reach the community let us be the church that stands up in this community and says to the people around us, there is a God that loves you. Let us be able to do it through our words, but also through our actions, God. Let, it, let there not be any question that what we have because we have you is different. Give them no reason to question your love because of the way that we act or the way that we speak or the way that we do things, God. I just pray for... Um, for your guidance. I pray for your guidance. Thank you that you love us enough to um, work, you know, just to, to even want to use us. Thanks for loving us. Amen.